Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for this um, important talk. I'm Dr. Amy French. I am the uh, History Department's coordinator. Um, some would call that a, a chair. Uh, so I get the pleasure of, uh, of being in the same department as our esteemed speaker today. Uh, and uh, I'm very excited about this brown bag. This came, um, Professor Zalagi was, uh, you know, he's an amazing person. I'll talk about his credentials in a second here. Um, but about uh, uh, le like less than two weeks ago, um, I had gotten a few community members who had said, uh, they some were just saying things like Hamas, you know, and they're like, what is this? What, what What's going on? How do we understand this? Um, and I was heartened that they thought of us, you know, that they thought of the history department at Delta College and as the, you know, the place that you go for answers. And what are we here to do but provide answers to the community, right? We are the community's college. And so that's what we're here to do is to provide us with some of the, um, to help us untangle, you know, what's going on in our world? Who are these groups? You know, what is, what is the context for which uh, these conflicts have gone on for the past, uh, you know, uh, half a century. And, and so, um, thankfully I had Jason <laughs> and so, um, I had an expert right in my own faculty body. I didn't have to look any further. Um, Jason, uh, professor Zalagi, he uh, got his master's degree from central Michigan university, um, uh, with, uh, looking at 20th century European history, the history of the Holocaust. Um, in modern Middle Eastern studies. Um, he has worked at the at Central Mi uh, Michigan Universities where he's taught classes on ancient uh, medieval and modern Middle East, as well as the history of modern Israel. Um, and he was the, um, the advisor for the Islamic and Middle Eastern studies program there. Um, here, I'm uh, you know, fortunate to have him and our faculty body teaching uh, a host of courses um, and, and uh, you know, really focusing on the modern world. And that's where he's going to help us today um, unpack this and look at um, Israel and the issues going on currently and providing us with the historical context for the Gaza Strip. Well, hi, everybody. I, I see a lot of familiar faces in here, and that's, that's good. That's good to see. Uh, so just, you know, a little precursor to this. This is not by any means... A, an extensive, super in-depth discussion of what is going on in Israel and the Gaza Strip right now. That would require multiple 16-week classes because I've taught them and, I, and I've taken them. So uh, what I'm going to do is just try to give a history of the region, a history of some of the groups, uh, and talk about the wars that have taken place since 1947. Okay, because this is, we're looking at almost 80 years that this, these conflicts have been stretching. So with the first slide, the introductory slide, these are three different maps of what is, uh, what was supposed to be the split between Israel and Palestine. Uh, the first map that is the UN's designation, okay, the territories that are in blue, those would have been uh, the Jewish home state. So the first picture that you're seeing, the first map that you're seeing, okay, that is what the United Nations 181 resolution was supposed to be the split between a Palestinian state and, okay, a, a Jewish state. And so the territory that's in the blue, that would have been the Jewish home state. The territory that is in the orange, that is what would have been left for the Palestinians. Uh, and this is coming from uh, a couple of previous attempts by the British to come up with uh, an idea of how to split this region up because they had been administering it since 1920. And they hadn't been able to go through the process of figuring out a, an even way to split this. this. Part of the problem is it's not that these communities were completely separated in these different areas. They're all intermixed. Okay? And then it also comes to the problem of if we're going to form these two states, how are they actually going to be politically and economically viable? Okay, how are they going to be able to actually take care of their people and function in a larger uh, world environment? 
And so what ends up happening is, as you're looking at the middle map, this is actually what will be the original state of Israel in 1949. This is after the Israeli War of Independence, which was fought in 1947, well, at the end of 1947 into 1948. And you can see just with those two maps that the new state of Israel actually absorbed quite a bit of what should have been the Palestinian state. Okay, and we'll get into the context behind that as we go through. Every, the other uh, territories that you're seeing, the other colors that you're seeing there, green is the orange, uh, green is the West Bank. This, again, was supposed to be Palestinian territory, and what ended up happening was the Jordanians took it over. Okay, and they were going to administer it and run it for themselves. Uh, up at the top, you have the Golan Heights. Okay, that is on the border of Israel and Syria. And then if you're looking at the bottom left, you're seeing the Gaza Strip, okay, a blue territory that the Egyptians, after 1949, will govern, in theory. <laughs> then the next map, yes? You said towards independence. Independence mm -hmm. for Independence from, uh, the way the Israelis put it, it is the establishment of their Jewish state. It is independence from having to rely on any outside power to basically protect Jewish people inside their territories. This is coming after the Holocaust. Okay, so during World War II from 1939 to 1945, over six million European Jews are slaughtered. They're murdered by the Nazis. And so there had already been a Jewish community living in Palestine for centuries up to this point. Uh, we're going to get into the drive for what will be the Zionist party, the idea of establishing an official Jewish homeland in the territory that they choose is Palestine. And so for the Israelis, when they're saying it's a war of independence, they're asserting that they are going to establish this state no matter what the Palestinians or the surrounding Arab states want. Okay, so there's, there's, that's the thing. This is a sensitive topic because it, cuts on both sides. Uh, there's no black and white with this. This is, this is a lot of shades of gray uh, as we go through. Is that definition of the Zionist the once established Jewish state? Yes. Okay, yeah. The, the Zionist organization actually comes about in Europe because of what is happening in the Russian Empire, uh, what will be happening in France with the Dreyfus Affair. Again, like I said, this is a huge thing, so I'm not going to go super into detail with all these things. But the World Zionist Commission, it was a collection of different intellectuals and politicians from all different countries that were basically meeting together in order to see if a European country, since Europe controlled a large part of the world as their colonies, whether they would be willing to help establish this state. Yeah. The third map, this is the after effects of the Six Day War fought in June of 1967. And this is what a lot of historians for this time that cover this particular time period, this is the war that broke the Middle East. Because this is where the Israelis went in and they took the territories that were being administered by the other Arab states. Uh, and we'll get into what is going on with that because, again, there's a lot that's going to be unpacked with this. So what I'm going to do is kind of jump in and just give you an idea of what uh, is happening here. So, right. you know, I'm not going to go back to the beginning of time and explain everything that's in there, but one of the areas that the Zionists had wanted, okay, historically was the region of Palestine. That had been from, you know, centuries back, since uh, ancient times, all the way up to the Roman Empire, that had historically been the homeland of the Jewish people. Uh, after a series of Jewish revolts against the Romans, they basically destroy that kingdom, and they scatter the Jewish population throughout the empire. It's the dysphoria, uh, hoping that that would basically destroy the Jewish people, so they wouldn't have that okay, fight again. And like I said, this is way back. We're a couple thousand years back here. But fast forward to it. The region that Palestine is in is actually controlled by the Ottoman Empire, which by the time uh, of the 20th century, the Ottoman Empire has been around roughly 500 years, and it controlled the vast majority of the Middle East. And uh, the Ottomans had 
proclaimed themselves when they took over certain areas, the protectors of Sunni Islam, which is the majority uh, of, of uh, Muslims in the world. Uh, and for the Ottomans, they controlled the three most holy cities for Muslims, okay, Mecca, Medina, and Jerusalem as well. Okay, so there's not a good way to point this out, but I'll go over here for a second. Okay, we've got Jerusalem here, okay, Mecca and Medina. Okay, and there had been, we in the modern world have this idea that all of these territories are kind of homogenous, meaning that there's not much in the way of mixed cultures or ethnicities or religions, but that's not the case. In this region, you have Arabs uh, who are going to be Muslims, who are going to be Christians, who are going to be Jews that are living in these territories together. Uh, and by the time you get to the 20th century, the beginning of it, the Ottoman Empire is really on its last legs. Okay? It has been losing an increasingly large territory, uh, fighting against the Russians okay, in the 1800s, and then right before the First World War breaks out, you have two Balkan Wars, which is basically places like Greece and Romania and Bulgaria and Serbia trying to break away from the Ottoman Empire and form their own independent states. So by the time you actually get to 1914, the Ottoman Empire has shrunk a lot, and it is not able to keep up economically or militarily, okay, with all of the other great powers that are around it. When the First World War breaks out in 1914, the Ottomans declare their neutrality initially because they don't want to be involved in this. But they are convinced in October 1914 to join the side of the Central Powers, Germany and Austria-Hungary. Uh, the Germans had been feeding money and technology weapons, advisors into the Ottoman Empire to try to modernize that state. And the Germans said that they weren't interested okay, in taking any Ottoman territory. Where with the British and French, who had been helping the Ottomans in the 19th century, they expected what were called concessions, meaning that the Ottoman Empire would allow Britain and France to kind of quasi-administer certain parts of the empire. Uh, France was interested in what is today the modern state of Lebanon in Syria, and Britain was concerned with Palestine. And so the thought that the central powers were going to be able to defeat Britain and France, that and Russia especially, that could very well have given the Ottomans back the territory they had been losing for 50 years prior to this. But it does not work out at all for the Ottomans. They go into this basically completely uh, unprepared, and they're going to pay a heavy price for this. Even inside the Ottoman Empire, okay, there are a lot of different ethnic and national groups that do not want to be part of the Ottoman Empire anymore. One of them is going to be the Arab tribes okay, in the Arabian Peninsula. There's two main leaders, two main groups, but I'm only going to concentrate on one of them because they really are the ones that are the important ones. Uh, these are going to be the Hashemites, okay? And it's going to be uh, Hussein ibn Ali, who's king of the Hejaz, which is going to be the territory that's on the west side of the Arabian Peninsula, which includes Mecca and Medina. Technically, he's an Ottoman subject, but the British reach out to him in 1915 and 1916 asking if he would be interested in getting the tribes that were loyal to him to revolt against the Ottomans. Okay, again, it's the idea that they're kind of okay, offering things to see what will stick okay, as they go through. Now, the Hashemites are still around, okay, at least in one territory. Uh, the Kingdom of Jordan, modern Kingdom of Jordan, just to the east of Israel, that is still a Hashemite kingdom. Okay, the other Hashemite kingdoms disappear okay, over the course of this. Uh, but basically what ends up happening is you have this Arab revolt that takes place in 1916 to 1918, and it is to help the British army that is trying to invade the Ottoman Empire out of Egypt. And each of these groups, whether it's the British government or the Hashemites, kind of have different understandings of what they think 
is going to be the post-war world when it's over. Okay? One of the people who is going to be an advisor to the Hashemites and actually takes their side when it comes to the Treaty of Versailles is T.E. Lawrence. Okay? Or, you know, in the West, we know him as Lawrence of Arabia. Okay? He had been uh, a British intelligence officer who had been in the Middle East before the war had broken out, and so he had some contacts. He understood the culture, and so when it came time to, you know, kind of bring uh, the Hashemites in, he's the one who's going to be the liaison with them, and he is going to be fighting with them. Okay, he's embedded with them. Okay, so the person at the top, that is going to be Hussein ibn Ali. Okay, he is king of the Hejaz. The person that is immediately to his uh, left is his oldest son, Faisal. And then the one, okay, towards the bottom right, that is going to be uh, his son, Abdullah. And then, of course, Lawrence of Arabia. He's presented in different ways, depending on where you're at and in what time period. Okay, for a lot of people in the West, at least, we see him as this British officer. When he's with the Arabs, he adopts their dress, he adopts their customs. Okay, and so he's he becomes very sympathetic for them. Okay, as things go through. Now, Egypt was part of the British Empire, and it had a high commissioner, meaning that it's a British civil servant who's actually controlling that territory, not native Egyptians. Okay, and this man's name was uh, Arthur Henry McMahon. He's the one who initiates okay, the communication with the Hashemites, okay, and he is basically trying to figure out how he can get them to come into the war. There is a lot of things that are going to be involved in this. Because the Hashemites control Mecca and Medina, okay, they would be what they would be considered called uh, kind of sharifs or grand sharifs, meaning that not only are they the king of that territory, they're also the religious leaders of the area. And if this particular sharif rebels against the Ottomans, there's a potential that other Muslims in that territory will do the same thing. Okay, one of the things that the Ottomans did at the outbreak of the war was that one of their uh, religious leaders, their imams that was in uh, Constantinople or Istanbul, called Muslims around the world to jihad against the British and French. And the British and French had Muslim subjects in their colonial territories. So there's politics, there's warfare, and there's religion all mixed into these things. And so with the British, they're hoping that if they could get the, the person who is kind of the protector of Mecca, to turn on the Ottomans that will keep their own Muslim populations content and it will also potentially rile up Ottoman subjects to turn. Okay. The other thing that's important about the Hashemites is that their clan is the same clan that Muhammad, the Prophet Muhammad, comes from. So again, uh, he is, this family has a lot of very important connections to ancient history into the 20th century. Uh, so what starts to happen in this Hussein uh, and McMahon correspondence is, you know, the British are asking, well, what would it take for you to turn on the Ottomans? And, you know, they're like, we'll offer you money, we'll offer you weapons. But the Hashemites want their own kingdoms. They don't want to be part of the Ottomans anymore. They do not want to be part of a, a British empire or a French empire. The Hashemites want to have their own independent Arab states with, of course, them as the leaders. Okay, since they're the ones who are going to be leading okay, the attacks and they're going to be the ones bringing up their people, they view it as this is part of the agreement if we're going to do this. And so in this map, this is what the Hashemites thought was going to happen. Okay, everything that is in the light pink, that would have been territory that they would have controlled on their own, as an independent kingdom. So it would have included parts of Iraq, parts of Syria, parts of Lebanon, Palestine, and Jordan. Okay, and then it was up to uh, Hussein to figure out which of his sons would get what territories. The region that is in the purple, that is what the French wanted from this, okay, because they're going to be included in it too. The dark pink that is territory that the British are going to take over for themselves. So that's mostly central and southern Iraq. And the reason they want that territory is that Britain is basically in control of the Persian kingdom at this time. And that's where they're getting the majority of their oil, which is what they're using to fuel their navy and fuel their army. 
before the war broke out, there were exploratory surveys in Mesopotamia, because Iraq does not exist yet, okay, in the Mesopotamia, and there were oil fields that were discovered. So for the British, this is a way to get more and to not eye it to future enemies as they go through. So while this plan was never officially agreed upon, it was the understanding for the Hashemites that this is what was going to happen. While McMahon is negotiating with them, Britain is negotiating with France and Russia of how they're going to split the Ottoman Empire up between them when the war is over. And that cuts the Hashemites and anybody else who's in the Ottoman Empire out of the picture. Okay. And this is going to be what's called the Sykes-Picot Agreement. Uh, there was a Russian uh, uh, that was involved in this, but once you had the Russian Revolution and Russia makes its uh, treaty with the Central Powers, Russia's off the charts. And it's just going to be Britain and France instead. And so in the map, uh, you have the different spheres of influence that the British and French are going to split okay, the Middle East into. Okay, and again, this is without the consent of any of the peoples that are living in there. This is people in Paris and London making arbitrary decisions. Uh, after the end of the First World War and you get the, the Treaty of Versailles, when you see straight lines on a map, that's going to be the British and French dividing up the world because they're trying to divide it as evenly as they can amongst themselves. But that doesn't take into account the different ethnicities and nationalities and other groups that are going to be in there that have to live with each other in these territories. Okay. So what they've decided to do is the area in the yellow, that is where Palestine is at. That is supposed to be an international zone that is going to be administered by what will be the League of Nations. Okay, an international body that is created after the First World War is a proto-UN. The idea that they are set up in order to basically stop territorial disputes or ethnic disputes inside territories from becoming wars or massacres. Okay, and so it's supposed to be the League of Nations that is going to administer this area. And the reason behind it is, to a degree, uh, the hot topic of Jerusalem. You have all three major monotheistic religions claiming that as a very significant religious site to them. Okay, uh, the Jewish people, that it was their historic homeland. That is the site of their first temple. For Christians, this is the site where many of the events of Christ's life were at, where he is going to be tried and eventually executed. Okay, and then resurrect. For Muslims, they end up, they look at the, the Temple Mount, the area where the first and second Jewish temples have been. Uh, that is where, according to their tradition, where Muhammad had his night journey, where he goes from Mecca to Jerusalem, from Jerusalem to heaven, to speak to all the previous prophets. And then when he's done, he goes from Jerusalem back okay, to Mecca. For Muslims, they see that rock. Okay? That's why they, have, they build this Dome of the Rock. That is tied to where Muhammad had been in the night journey. For them, it also ties to where Abraham, the patriarch of all three of these religions, where he was either going to sacrifice Isaac, okay, according to Christians and Jews, or Ishmael, according to Muslims. So all three of these religions have massive cultural, religious identifiers in this. And so the idea that the League of Nations was going to be the one to administer this basically mean it was hands off. Okay? No power in theory had sole right to determine what was there. The area was supposed to be open for worship for all three of these religions to go through. But even that is going to change. Okay? Again, the best plans come up and then reality happens and things uh, go awry. Okay, so this Sykes-Picot agreement, the Hashemites do not know that this exists when they're putting together the negotiations. And this is going to be a major surprise to them when they find out about this. And it comes on the heels of another declaration. Okay. That's another uh, deal that is kind of being worked out that is not necessarily British policy when it's first announced is going to be the Belfort Declaration, which is released uh, on November 2nd, 1917. Arthur Belford had been a prime minister 
of Britain. Uh, from 1902 to 1905, he had been in and out of the British government since then. Uh, in 1917, he's brought back in to a coalition government, and he is the, uh, he's the foreign secretary, meaning that he's the one who's going to be in charge of colonial affairs, foreign policy, uh, and then also kind of determine what British policy will be after the war. He is talking to one of the Rothschilds, okay, a very, very wealthy, powerful Jewish family that is part of the Zionist organization. Belford is writing this telegram to Rothschild, and it's supposed to be private. He's basically saying that the British government will support the creation of a Jewish homeland in Palestine, but the details have not been worked out at all. Okay, they haven't decided whether they're going to, you know, if this is going to be a multi-ethnic uh, and religious state, whether they're going to allow, okay, the Palestinians to stay, or whether it is strictly a, a Jewish territory. There's nothing that's really in writing, but this gets leaked out to the press. And for the central powers, okay, Germany and Austria and the Ottomans, this is perfect for them because this could potentially derail the Arab revolt. This could potentially derail uh, what has been happening to kind of keep the Muslim populations inside the allied countries calm. Okay, so when it's put out, okay, this is another blow to the Hashemite and British relationship. And it is going to be difficult for, once this is out, the British government is forced to basically recognize that they're going to do this at some point, but they have no plan to it. Okay, they have no way, no idea how they would partition the territory or uh, make it so that if they weren't going to partition it, how do you have these groups work together in this new state? So this is a real huge stick in the mud, so to speak. Was Lawrence still involved in Yes. He's, Lawrence of Arabia is still involved. He does not know that this Sykes-Picot agreement has come in and he has... He is with the Hashemites in the understanding of the McMahon. When Lawrence finds out about this, he is the person who has to break it to the Hashemites to basically tell them that there's going to be, you know, things have not necessarily gone the way that we thought they were going to be. But Lawrence is going to actually go with the Hashemites when they go to Paris. He does not go as a member of the British military. He goes as an envoy for the Hashemites to try to fight to get them some of the things they thought they were going to get. So when the Ottoman Empire surrenders in October of 1918, in effect, what that means is that their government, their territory, that whole entity is gone. Okay? The fighting has stopped between the Allies and the Central Powers by November 1918, but it is temp this is a ceasefire. The actual treaties that stop World War I do not come until... 1920 and 1921. Okay, the, treaty, the, the armistice that happens uh, November 11th, 1918, that is just basically stopping them from killing each other. But it has not solved any of the issues of how these empires are going to be divided up now that they've lost. Okay, and what ends up happening is that the British and French, as far as their governments are concerned, the Sykes-Picot Agreement, where they're splitting up the Middle East, that's the only legitimate agreement anywhere. And that's the only one that they're going to back up. They do make some concessions, though. Uh, what ends up happening with the League of Nations is that uh, they're going to become what are called mandate states, meaning that it's going to be the British and French governments that pretty much oversee these territories until they feel that those countries are mature enough to handle themselves. And then eventually they'll spin them off. But the mandate policy does not have a time limit. Okay, it could be 10 years, it could be 5 years, it could be 20 years, it could be 50 years. There's nothing saying that you know, there is a set time when these places are going to withdraw. Now, what ends up happening is that for the British, they do try and fail to give the Hashemites something okay, in order to keep them uh, on their side. And what has happened is that Palestine and what will be Jordan 
are one territory at this point. Okay, and in order for there to be kind of an idea of what is going to be this potential future homeland for uh, the Jews versus what is strictly Arab territory is that the region is split. Okay, everything west of the River Jordan, okay, so everything that is, listed, that is in the dark yellow that is listed Palestine, that is area for future potential Jewish immigration. Everything east of the Jordan River, that is what is going to be called Transjordan, or eventually what it will be, the Kingdom of Jordan. And there isn't supposed to be any Jewish immigration there. Transjordan is going to go to okay, uh, the son Abdullah. Okay, he's going to be the king of that, and his children and grandchildren are still ruling this territory today. Okay, he's the only Hashemite really who survives. <laughs> his dynasty is the only one that's still going. Faisal, he believed that he was going to get Syria, but that fell into the French territory. And they told him no. And so in 1920 and 1921, Faisal rises, or gets his followers to try to fight against the French and ask the British for help. And the British aren't going to go. And so what ends up happening is that Faisal and his followers are expelled as compensation Faisal is going to get the new kingdom of Iraq. Okay. He is going to die within only five or six years of taking that territory over. His son is going to die in a car accident, and he's only in his 20s. And then it's going to be his poor grandson, who's only 10, who's going to try to administer Iraq until he's assassinated in the 1950s. So with the Hashemites, it, them being undercut so badly by the British and French during the, the division of the Ottoman Empire, for the local Arabs, whether they're Muslim or they're Christian, that is, for them, a betrayal. Okay? The Hashemites rose up to get rid of the Ottomans to have independent states. Now they have to be administered by the British and French, and they will eventually release them from that status in the future but nobody knows when. Okay, Jerusalem still, that, the city and the surrounding areas, while it is in British Mandate Palestine, that is administered by the League of Nations. So there's still further division inside this thing. Okay. Now, through the 1920s and 1930s, there had been a number of violent incidents between... Uh, inside Palestine between Zionist extremist groups and Palestinian extremist groups, where they would go through the process of killing each other. Okay? And what the British had to do was in the 1920s and 1930s, they sent commissions after each of these to try to figure out how they could get the two sides to either stop or to come up with the idea of partition. Okay? And eventually the British realized that you know, there's no way that this is going to work. Okay, we'll have to divide the territory up, but we need a better plan to it. In between 1936 and 1939 in Palestine, you have what's called the Great Arab Revolt. Okay, it is Palestinians rising up against both the British, okay, and okay, the, the Jewish populations that are living in there. And the British Army has to crush these uprisings. It takes three years before World War II breaks out. And then after that, during World War II, the British have a very hard time administering a lot of the territories they have in the Middle East because Nazi Germany is trying to get some of these states to rise up against the British and the French. So there's a lot of things that are you know, involved in this. It's not just this region and these two groups of people that have their kind of claws dug into this conflict. This is all over the world that this is going on. When World War II ends uh, in 1945, okay, the British have basically kind of made the declaration that they are done with the Palestinian mandate. They do not want it anymore. And so they will turn it over to the newly minted United Nations. And then it's their problem to either partition or keep it as one state and figure out how they're going to do that. So the maps that you're seeing Okay, if we're looking at the kind of the first one from 1920 to 1946, 
uh, the areas that are in orange, those are the heaviest concentrations of uh, Jewish citizens living inside Palestine. These would be people who lived there before the war broke out, and these are where people, the survivors of the Holocaust, are going after the war. Uh, in 19, throughout the 1940s, uh, Britain had the policy of trying to limit uh, Jewish immigration into this territory because they did not want to have to garrison more of this area while World War II is going on. And they kind of enforced that through 1946 and 1947. Now, you have UN Resolution 181, okay, which is going to be you know, called the Partition Resolution. This is basically kind of picking up where the British left off or never started. It's the idea of splitting the territory between the Jews and the Palestinians. And again, uh, Jerusalem and the, some of the surrounding area is supposed to be run by the UN. It's a free city or it's free territory. Neither one of these states is going to have control over that area. So that's that little blob in the orange around Jerusalem. Okay. Uh, and the British are withdrawing. Okay, they're taking out not only their military and their administrative groups, they're also taking out their civilian populations. And they say that they're going to be done in 1947. Mm -hmm. that, is an excellent, that is an excellent question, and uh, nobody in their right mind, nobody who actually lived there, was asked what they were going to do. Think of it, think of it this way, and it's, it's a weird way of putting it, but think about your own situation. You're at home, okay, and, you, and your ancestors have lived in this area for multiple generations, and you own houses or farms or factories or orchards or whatever it is that you have as property. And then all of a sudden the United Nations comes along and says that the Native American tribes that had been displaced by the U.S. government a century and a half back can come to your territory and expel you and take that area over because that is historically their homeland, historical precedent. It's, this is a very touchy subject. And it hits in a lot of different areas. While the World Zionist Organization and the British government and, it, and other powers are meddling in this area, for the most part, they're not looking at what's happening on the ground. They're not asking the people that are in there whether they can coexist or whether they will accept this arbitrary division. And so it hits the point where it's like, this is what it is going to be. And you have to go through with it. What ends up happening is UN Resolution 181. The UN had asked representatives from the Jewish community inside Palestine and the Palestinians to meet with them and look at what this division was going to be. The Palestinian representatives do not go because in their view, they're looking at it as, this is where we live. This is our homeland. The Jewish population that is here is fine. We do not want more to come in. Because the way the British had talked about splitting it up when they had the mandate was based on population. So if you allow more people coming in, okay, more Jewish people to come in from Europe or other places, that is going to upset the population balance. Meaning if there is a massive influx of, as horrible as it sounds, Holocaust survivors coming in there, that's another million and a half people in a territory that maybe has 14 or 15 million people. So it's going to, again, that, those numbers will push for more territory to be taken away. And again, you know, the, even this map, is, the UN map, is totally unrealistic because all these different enclaves are split apart. There's no connections to them in terms of being able to move resources back and forth or have people move back and forth. There's not any industrial or agricultural base that's really going to be big enough in order for either population to really survive. And so to a degree, this UN Resolution 181 is, it's a pipe dream. And some of what is coming through with the idea of this is the fact that a, a lot of Western countries in the 1930s and 1940s did not allow German 
in Austria and in other Jewish populations to flee Europe before the Second World War broke out. So that's what I mean. There's so many things that are tied into this that are, again, it is painful to go through the process and talk about this because it touches all of us. This is a shadow that has been over us for decades and will remain that way. Mm-hmm. There's a history of antagonism between Jews and Palestinians. There is. There is. There has been for several decades up to this point. Even with the, when the Ottomans were administering the territory, the British were pressuring the Ottomans to let more European Jews emigrate there. And the Ottomans tried to keep the Palestinians away from them, but in the same sense, they had to balance their their own priorities too. And so again, this is something that is going back you know, 100 years, if not more, as we go through. So what will end up happening is that even among the Jewish community in Israel, or in Palestine at the time, when they're meeting for this, there's different groups inside that that are arguing how this should be implemented and what should be done. For the what we call kind of the maximalists, the ones who wanted the largest proportion of territory for a Jewish state, they basically kind of look at it as whoever is in there that is not one of us can be absorbed in another Arab country. You have the minimalists, which are the people who are saying, look, if we do this to the Palestinians, are we any better than what anti-Semites have done to us in Europe and other places? If we force them out of the territory, if we force them to not be able to be in the government or education, or any other part of civil society, aren't we doing the exact same thing? And unfortunately, the minimalists are ignored. Okay? And there are still, that faction is still in the Israeli government, but they have been outweighed by the centrists and the more right-leaning ones. Okay? So when the UN is coming up with this resolution, okay, the Jewish representatives sign on to it, and the Palestinians are not there. So they are viewed uh, as far as you know, some of these representatives are concerned. Since they skipped the, the vote and the signing of it, it doesn't matter what they have to say. Again, it's the idea that you know, it's these different groups uh, kind of pitted against each other. Once this resolution goes through in May 1948, the same day, Okay, May 14th, 1948, David Ben-Gurion, who had been head okay, of the Jewish community inside Palestine, okay, he proclaims the new Jewish state of Israel, and he proclaims himself as the new prime minister. Okay, basically, he's saying that okay, the UN has given authorization for the state to be created, and we are going to do it, regardless of what the opinion of, of the surrounding countries are, or even some of the population that lives here. Uh, and he is looking at, he makes the declaration that because of what has happened from the 1930s to 1945, this Jewish state has to exist because other countries did not protect us. Okay? And this Jewish state will be the thing that protects us okay, as we go through there. Now, in World War II, the United States had a very cautious approach to this. Okay, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who had won four terms as U.S. president, uh, in 1943 and 1944, he had met with King Ibn Saud of Saudi Arabia. And they, uh, Saud is probably the most powerful of the Arab leaders at this point in time. He's one of the only countries that's actually independent in the Middle East. And he approaches FDR asking is the United States going to back up the creation of a Jewish state or not? And there's some concessions with this. If the U.S. will not do that, then the Saudis will help Western Europe rebuild via cheaper fuel, cheaper oil. And FDR says the U.S. is not interested in upsetting the balance in this area with FDR. And he kept that correspondence going almost up to the point where FDR dies in 1945. And then Harry Truman becomes the next U.S. president. He was FDR's vice president. 
when World War II is over, okay, Truman ends up uh, basically being elected again uh, to serve his own term as president. And against the kind of advice of George C. Marshall, who's the U.S. Secretary of State, who had been head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff in World War II and understood what Roosevelt had tried to put together as a new, you know, what the world was going to look like when it was done, Marshall tries to caution him. He says, look, don't immediately jump into this. Let other countries kind of go in first, and then maybe we'll go in. Truman jumps. He's one of the first heads of state to officially recognize Israel. And then the Soviet Union recognizes the state of Israel the same day. You're getting the Cold War being played out in 1948 immediately. Now, there's going to this uh, Israeli War of Independence. This is going to be, you know, in 1948. But there's a period of a couple months where it is, the other Arab states have not invaded yet. What is going to happen for the first few months is that you will get into what is, for the Palestinians, they call the Nakba, or the nightmare. And that's where 775,000 of them are displaced. Okay. Uh, the, the state of Israel, okay, if you're looking at the map that's on the left, okay, what ends up happening is the territory that is in the blue, that is what the state of Israel was supposed to be, with Resolution 181. By the time the Israeli War of Independence is over, Everything that is in the purple, that is territory that was supposed to be from this partitioned Palestinian state that Israel took and did not give back. Then the other parts, uh, like the West Bank, the Gaza Strip, and the Golan Heights, the surrounding Arab countries take them. So there really is no Palestinian state from 181 because if the Israelis didn't take it, the surrounding Arab territories did. And what ends up happening is the United Nations goes through and puts together, uh, it's going to be called the Rhodes Armistice. And basically, it's to get the Arab countries and Israel to stop fighting. And basically kind of give a border that will exist from 1948 until 1967. And so what ends up happening is that uh, you have this kind of uneasy peace for the next 19 years. There's going to be raids back and forth okay, between different, different groups, whether they're Israeli or whether they're Palestinian or surrounding Arab states. And then the war that breaks everything is in June of 1967. It is a six-day war. Okay, it is literally a war that is only six days long, and that's all the time the Israelis need to crush all the surrounding Arab states. Okay, this had been building since 1956. Uh, even with the UN officially recognizing Israel, the US, uh, the Soviet Union, Britain, and France uh, in the late 40s through the 50s, none of the surrounding Arab states had recognized Israel as being real. As far as they were concerned, it was Palestine, and it was occupied. So they have no formal recognition. They have no diplomats with Israel. They, have, uh, they basically look at it as territory that needs to be liberated. Okay, now, what is going to happen in uh, the summer of 1967 from May forward is that Israel is getting intelligence that Egypt and Syria are massing along their common borders with Israel okay, for an invasion. And the Israeli government and military decide that it is better to do a preemptive attack, meaning that they're the ones who are going to hit okay, the Arab states before they're ready. And it's in defense. Uh, and Jordan initially is not, was not friendly to Egypt and Syria. Uh, king Abdullah, the one who originally was the original uh, king of Jordan, he was assassinated by fellow Arabs. And his son took over, and he was constantly in fear that Syria and Egypt would try to overthrow his rule. And so he tried to stay neutral. Uh, but when he does not give assurances to the Israeli government in Tel Aviv, they decide that the Jordanians are probably going to be part of this too. And so Jordan is going to be added into this attack. On the morning of June 5th, the Israeli Air Force hits targets all throughout Egypt, 
Syria, and Jordan, and basically wipes out the Arab states' air forces on the ground. And then they launch a attack, a ground attack, in order to kind of secure the borders to ensure that the Arab states can't come in to the territories that they're claiming uh, from uh, the Palestinians. So the, the, the map that's on the left of the image, that is Israel and the Arab states okay, in June, probably about June 5th, 1967. The map on the right, that is all the territory that Israel has taken from those states in those six days. So they have occupied the West Bank, including Jerusalem, all the way up to the Jordan River. They have taken the Golan Heights, okay, away from Syria, and they're actually pushing towards Damascus, which is the Syrian capital. Uh, the Israelis have overrun the Gaza Strip and all of the Sinai Peninsula. The Israelis get up to the Suez Canal before the UN goes through and puts together, uh, again, another armistice. And for the Israelis, they look at it as the territory that they have now occupied. Perhaps that could be used as bargaining trips with the Arab states. Okay, a permanent peace with them and official recognition for some of it. And if the Arab states won't do that, then those become buffer areas between Israel itself and the potential okay, next threat. A lot of the Palestinians who had been displaced in 48, especially in the West Bank, go right back into Israel in this occupied area. Lebanon was staying out of this. Uh, a lot of the territory that had been in this region after the First World War, it is still kind of forming through there. Like Lebanon is this, it's, for the French, they wanted Lebanon attached to Syria. Uh, and Lebanon is a mixture of Arabs and Christians, different uh, Islamic communities that do not necessarily get along with each other. Lebanon kind of stays out of it, but they do host a considerable population of displaced Palestinians. Another thing that I haven't mentioned about this is that the Palestinians who went into the territories that were occupied by the other Arab states in 48, those Arab states did not give them citizenship in their own territories. Okay, so they're, they have been refugees from 1948 to now. The only one that has done that, that has given them citizenship, is Jordan. Because the majority of the Jordanians are Palestinians. So they had, they had to go through that process and, and do that. Now, the failure of the Arab states in the Six-Day War, this is going to reinforce an organization that has been founded in 1959. Uh, Yasser Arafat is a Palestinian intellectual. He becomes the face of Palestinian resistance. He had uh, been one of the founding members of Fatah, which is uh, the Palestinian National Liberation Movement. <laughs> He had been in Egypt for a while, and then he goes from Egypt to the West Bank, and he is in Jerusalem, and then eventually he's going to go to Jordan uh, when it becomes too hot. But what will end up happening after 67 is that as the, what you would consider traditional Palestinian political leaders are not able to get the UN to actually address any of their issues, and the Arab states keep failing in their military operations and then marginalizing the Palestinians that are in their territory, this is where you're going to get the extremist groups that start to gain popularity because they are the ones who are going to keep pushing the issue of what is happening with the Palestinians into the worldview. So you're going to start seeing in the 60s hijackings of planes. Some cases, they're taken on the ground. Okay, and the, the gunmen who are in there, what they'll do is they'll you know, make their declaration of why they're doing it. They'll release uh, the majority of the hostages, and then sometimes they'll destroy the plane while it's on the ground. Uh, other times when you're getting into the late 70s and early 80s when these hijackings take place, it's while they're in the air, and then the planes get redirected to some other area. Uh, and usually what the Palestinians are asking for is uh, members of the PLO to be released. Now, with the end of the Six-Day War, again, this is kind of a period where it could make or break relations in the Middle East. And 
Like the Golan Heights, that is seized more as a defensive area. Sinai Peninsula, a defensive area. The West Bank, when it gets taken, this is where the Israeli government and military, to degree, kind of lose track because there's the idea that, okay, the West Bank is supposed to be this international area where nobody is supposed to really have control over it. While Israel does not say that it is going to absorb that territory directly into Israel, they're not necessarily interested in giving it up either. You know, what will end up happening uh, during the course of the war and afterwards is that you have members of the Israeli government and the military going into Jerusalem and visiting places like the Lion's Gate and going to the Temple Mount, okay, and going onto the Temple Mount and posing in front of the Dome of the Rock. That is a provocation as far as Arabs are concerned, whether they're in Palestine or outside of it. Um, and this is going to be a constant source of tension from 67 all the way to today. Okay, this is going to be one of the hotbed incidents. And the Six-Day War is not the last time that Israel and the Arab states fight. And it's not the last time that the Palestinians are disappointed by the Arab states. You have the Yom Kippur War, which is going to happen in October of 1973, which we saw the 50-year anniversary Hamas launched their attack on southern Israel. Okay. The Yom Kippur War is another combined war with Egypt and Syria fighting against Israel. And in this case, they're the ones who launched the surprise attack. And this is a very costly war for the Israelis because the uh, Egyptian and Syrian armies have been re-equipped by the Soviet Union with their most modern weapons. And they have figured out how to stop the Israeli Air Force in its tracks and the Israeli armored forces in their tracks. The Egyptians will go through and actually form pontoon bridges across the Suez Canal and then use water hoses to knock down the sandbanks on the Sinai Peninsula in order to move military equipment across. They only go so far as the anti-aircraft missiles will cover them. And then they dig in and they wait for the Israelis to counterattack and they end up destroying the first couple waves of Israeli troops coming in. The uh, Syrians launch airborne attacks against the Golan Heights and then massed armor attacks. And the Israelis are able to stop them there. Now, what ends up happening is this war hit when there had already been, uh, in the earlier part of the summer of 1973, war scares between Israel and Syria and Egypt. And so if Israel calls up its reserves, that means it's the men and women who are military age coming out of the factories or whatever their civilian job is and then going into their units and then waiting to see what is going to happen. It freezes that state completely. And so after the war scare in August and September kind of died down, those reservists okay, went back to their civilian lives and many of them went overseas. And when the Arab states attacked, the Israelis are kind of on the ropes for the first couple days. Eventually, what ends up happening is the United States and the Soviet Union both pour huge amounts of military equipment into their prospective uh, ally in this region. And then at the end of October, you have a ceasefire. And this is going to be when Egypt actually will go through and uh, recognize Israel as a state and sign a permanent peace treaty with them. In exchange for the Sinai Peninsula, okay, Egypt will no longer be hostile. Okay, the Gaza Strip is kind of handed over to Israel, and then they're, it, they're going to administer it until 2003. Okay, and again, this is where a lot of Palestinians are there. Okay, so let me jump ahead. Sorry. Uh, one of the people who's kind of responsible for Egypt and Israel being recognized as they go through, as uh, basically getting them to go through, is Egyptian President Anwar Sadat and Israeli Prime Minister uh, Menchum Begin. They meet with U.S. President Jimmy Carter at Camp David in 78, and they sign the Camp David Accords, which basically normalizes relations between Egypt and Israel. Then in 1979, uh, you have late 1979, 
Well, Sadat is looking at a military parade in Egypt. Some radical members of the Egyptian military kill him, assassinate him, because he normalized relations with Egypt, or between Egypt and Israel. Things in Jordan are not going so hot between the Hashemites and the Palestinians. Uh, again, King Abdullah had been assassinated uh, after the uh, War of Israeli Independence. His son, okay, King Hussein, becomes the next king. And he is in this dangerous spot where the PLO that's operating in Palestine is working with the Syrian government to try to overthrow him. And in 1970, 1971, they have what's called Black September, where it's actually a Jordanian civil war. And Hussein is successful in putting it down, and he ends up expelling the PLO. And they end up going to Lebanon. And they will form, the splinter group that comes out of that will form Hezbollah. Okay. Uh, and with Hezbollah and Hamas, these are successor splinter groups to Fatah. They do not recognize the Palestinian Authority as being the thing that actually is representing the Palestinian people. And in their view, they will never negotiate with Israel or any other power to split that territory up. As far as they're concerned, all of that region is Palestine. I know I'm running a little bit over, but this, like I said, this is something that is, has come and gone throughout okay, the 20th century. Uh, you have the Lebanese Civil War that takes place in, from 1975 to 1990. Uh, again, between different uh, religious groups and ethnic groups fighting against each other and Hezbollah being involved in it too. They're lobbing rockets into northern Israel, which causes the Israelis in the early 80s to invade and occupy, at least briefly, southern Lebanon. But that does not expel Hezbollah. They're still there. Okay, and now you have the escalation where Hezbollah is saying they're going to back up Hamas okay, in this next attack. Okay. With Hamas, they are going to be in, whoops, sorry, jumping ahead a little bit. With Hamas, they are in the West Bank and they are in the Gaza Strip. And they are even more extreme than Hezbollah is. Okay, again, in their view, uh, the, what had been Fatah, what had been the Palestinian Authority, since it negotiated, multiple times, they no longer, in their view, have any authority over their fighters. And so if you look at Hamas's charter, top thing is they are never going to surrender. And they are never going to negotiate, no matter what happens. Okay. And you have uh, multiple instances of violence in the Gaza Strip in the late 80s, early 90s, late 90s, 2000s, to now. And this is not just a one-way street, okay, in terms of extremism and assassinations going back and forth. In 1993, okay, you have what will be the Oslo Accords, which is where uh, the Israeli government, with their Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin, will meet with okay, Yasser Arafat, who's head of the Palestinian Authority, and they will officially recognize each other. Okay, and in theory, in order to have this ceasefire go through, there will be no future uh, Israeli settlements being built in the West Bank, okay, the occupied territory. Okay, and so this goes through, and of course you got Bill Clinton in the background, you know, like, good job, guys. But what will happen is after this is signed, two years later, while Yitzhak Rabin is in Israel, in Tel Aviv, getting ready to give a speech saying that we have to actually do, you know, honor these Oslo Accords, he is assassinated by an Israeli ultranationalist, a man named uh, Igal Emir, who comes up to him while he's on the podium in the crowd and shoots him in the heart twice. Okay, and then Rabin is okay, uh, buried with full honors afterwards. A little while later, okay, you have another okay, uh, incident that is going to raise tension uh, and hatred in the region. And this is going to be what's called the Cave of the Patriarchs Massacre. This is going to be, again, another uh, Israeli ultranationalist who goes in to this, uh, the Ibrahimi Mosque. This is supposed to be the mosque where Abraham uh, and his sons are buried. Okay, so again, it's the patriarch of Judaism and Christianity and Islam. It's a place 
for you know peaceful prayers. He goes in and he kills 39 of the worshipers and wounds another 125. That is going to be followed by the first uh, Hamas suicide bombings throughout Israel and the occupied territories where they are people who are going to wear explosive vests that go into buses or restaurants or just in crowds and kill themselves in order to kill Israelis. Now this goes on sporadically between 1994 and 1999. Yitzhak Rabin is assassinated in UK 94, but you start to see a new political leader in Israel coming out, and that is Benjamin Netanyahu, who is going to be part of what's called the Likud Party, which is a far-right settlist party, meaning that they want to basically incorporate the West Bank completely into Israel. It's in their view, that is not Palestinian territory. It has traditionally been part of the Jewish state. And no matter what the UN says or anybody else, it's going to be absorbed into it. His first round okay, of being Israeli prime minister is going to be from 96 to 99. Uh, and initially, he kind of recognizes uh, Yasser Arafat's uh, political uh, is Palestinian authority. But at the same time, Netanyahu is helping to build Hamas up because it is an opposition party against Yasser Arafat. And so they're trying to break Palestinian unity. This is not something that is unusual. Okay, there are many instances where you know a group that is going to be called a terrorist organization is a friend at the time. Think of Osama bin Laden in the United States in Afghanistan when the Soviets were occupying that territory. He was one of our people until we didn't need him anymore. This is the same thing that happens with Maz and Netanyahu. And what starts to happen is the Oslo Accords are ignored. Okay, the, the settlements start to be built again and at a much more rapid pace. Another thing that ends up happening in September of 2000 is Ariel Sharon, who had been a Israeli military commander in the Six Day War and the Yom Kippur War, had been part of the, the Israeli government, had been a prime minister before. He goes and visits the Temple Mount, and he goes up to the Dome of the Rock. And it's, again, it's viewed by many Palestinians and many Muslims in the world as a provocation. He becomes Prime Minister of Israel from 2001 to 2005. Now, one thing that Sharon does end up doing, though, is that he agrees that the Gaza Strip, the, the Jewish settlements that are in there, are going to be evacuated between 2004 and 2005. So this will be a strictly Palestinian enclave. Okay? And in theory, the Israelis will still basically control the borders and the economy of the territory. But this little strip of land, which is only like five miles wide, maybe 30 miles long, is supposed to be self-administering. But they have no way of doing really anything. And in the process of that, the Gaza Strip and parts of the West Bank are going to be walled off to prevent Hamas or Hezbollah from infiltrating into Israel. And that does not work. Ultimately, there's only two exits out of Gaza one leading into Israel, and one leading into Egypt. And the Egyptians do not, even today, they do not want to absorb Palestinian refugees. Okay. Now we fast forward to 2006, and you have more trouble again between Israel and Hezbollah in southern Lebanon. Okay, Hezbollah starts launching rockets into northern Israel, and Israel retaliates by bombing Lebanon, Lebanese targets. And Lebanon itself is still trying to recover from its civil war. It is still a mess today. I mean, there's still trouble. They have no functioning government or economy. And so this is one of the things that gives Hezbollah kind of uh, priority and gives them more street credit, with, whether they're Palestinians or whether they're Lebanese. It's the idea that Hezbollah is able to move in food and move in medicine. And even though they're using some of these people 
as fighters and suicide bombers. Hezbollah is, you know, in their view, doing certain things. Now, what ends up happening in retaliation to this is in late 2006, the summer of 2006, there, is, there are democratic elections held by Palestinians. And what will end up happening is Hamas wins an overwhelming majority of that vote. And uh, Fatah and the Palestinian Authority, while they still exist, they're really kind of edged out of what many Palestinians view as legitimate power. Because Hezbollah and, and Hamas are talking about continuing the struggle, where the Palestinian Authority has made these treaties, but they've never actually come to fruition. Okay? And then one of the main suppliers for Hamas and Hezbollah is going to be Iran. Okay? Because Iran is, uh, it is an Islamic Republic. Okay, and while they are Shiite, and you know Hezbollah and Hamas is not completely uh, Shiite, they're still looking at it as uh, they are the lead resistance to Israel. And so Iran is going to give them everything they can in order to go through. And again, this is not just a regional area where it's just Iran helping those in northern uh, Lebanon or in the Gaza Strip. You have uh, militias that are going to be in Syria and Iraq and in Yemen that are supported by Iran. So this could very well explode into a region-wide conflict if uh, this keeps building okay, over the course of the next couple weeks. Yeah. But here, and here's where... No, they don't. But here's where the, the power of the region comes in. For the Iranian government, okay, this revolutionary government, they see themselves as the protectors of Shiite Islam. And they see themselves as the leading Muslim power in the world, regardless of whether they're involved in it or not. In opposition to them is Saudi Arabia, which is a Sunni power and which also has Mecca and Medina under its care. And they consider themselves the most powerful Muslim nation. And so what you're seeing is a Middle Eastern Cold War between these two states of which one is dominant. And with uh, everything that had been going on with the war on terror, the U.S. invasion of Iraq in 2003, that seriously disrupted the balance of power in that region. And we don't talk about it much, but we, used, we had the Iranians helping us in Afghanistan and when there was ISIS, uh, and when there was uh, ISIS in Iraq. We were using their militias, Iraqi militias, to help beat okay, ISIS in Iraq. So it's, uh, again, you have all these different states in these regions, and outside these regions, that are all playing these little power games. And the sad part is, is that it's the civilians in these regions that are the ones that suffer for it because they have no say in what is going on. Uh, they're trapped wherever they're at, whether it's in the Gaza Strip or the West Bank or northern Lebanon, or even the Israelis in Israel. Uh, they're a target stuck in this. And there has been no serious attempt to actually force both sides to cooperate and actually come up with a real solution. So I have gone way over <laughs> what I was supposed to do, but I do see a question of that. Okay, yeah. Let's get on